So, before we start the next talk, which will apparently feature a lot of charts, um, I just wanted to announce that the closing ceremony will be in the pirouette room, so in the other room, uh, right after this talk, actually. And here we have Herbert Kobelmiller with a radio inf interference structure and its security implementation. Uh, mechanism. Sorry. Yeah, thanks for introducing me. Uh, well, um, since um, I haven't prepared that much, uh, I thought it would be a good idea just to, to uh, have, have some st step back to that what I've heard uh, this morning. Uh, so this is actually something similar what I've seen in the last, uh, yeah, in the first two, two hours this day. And uh, actually, this is um, TEMS. So it's a monitoring tool for GSM, for 3G, and uh, for the LTE. And uh, we are running this software. And we, we do, yeah, uh, what do we do with that? Uh, we, get, uh, we try at least to get the most out of the network, to get the best performance of the network. And that's we, we use that for, yeah. So, to be honest, I'm from the operator side. Yeah? I'm uh, from Avon Telecom Austria. And uh, I've got the owner to, uh, to be the very last at this day, yeah? to be with the very last of these um, um, two days, let's say. And um, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, it's not the last. Maybe it's uh, some sort of uh, beginning of the future. Yeah? LTE, long-term evolution is uh, something that's going to be interesting for all operators right now yeah so the LTE sto uh, sorry the GSM story has has more or less gone I would say yeah. so the op from operator side the GSM is um, somehow treated as uh, getting the money from it from it yeah uh, with this perspective uh, it was very interesting to see for me the, this uh, first uh, two or maybe four hours today that uh, still there are some very interesting investigation done yeah? and uh, I fully agree with that uh, that this should uh, be yeah, should be an ongoing process and still should uh, should be continued yeah? Yeah, because there are for sure some security lacks and that should be solved yeah? and um, I was very was really very uh, surprised that I see the signaling yeah so layer 3 is already decoded on the air interface that what we already see from the commercial tools let's say uh, from commercial side we just do logging on uh, on one mobile but uh, what I've learned today is uh, that uh, it is possible to to trace any mobile yeah and that's going to be very interesting and um, yeah, keep on doing that I would say yeah um, <clears throat> since I'm yeah uh, and, and radio engineer, yeah, I'm very interested, and uh, maybe I'm gonna be uh, one part of that story as well. Yeah, I, tr I try to. Okay, uh, that's gonna be my f uh, my introduction. Yeah, I'm uh, in the in the field of radio optimization. I'm dealing with uh, this layer three, and uh, so this is Tucci. Yeah, the main interest is Tucci, but uh, I'm looking and uh, yeah. I'm one of a uh, few engineers at Avon Telecom Austria who are looking for the future for this LTE story. And that's going to be uh, what I want to present uh, to you. And uh, yeah, that's uh, this LTE radio interface and its security mechanism. Since I'm not the security expert, yeah, uh, I try to, to uh, get some somehow deeper in that subject. But uh, I'm not the expert, I have to admit. Yeah. I'm more the radio expert. Yeah. So uh, we will go to the, through the content anyway. Yeah. So it's more or less the basics. Yeah. It's not uh, that deep. Yeah. Although the deep uh, things are available. And uh, let me take uh, some comparison of the 2G, 3G, and LTE network in the packet domain. Yeah. So circuit domain seems to be something different, but. Uh, uh, as the LTE is packet only, yeah, from the beginning packet only, uh, we just can compare, yeah, the the two G, three G, and LTE in the packet domain, basically from the beginning, and we have different um, 
yeah, namings for the, the BTSs or the base transceiver station. Yeah, in, in 3G we call that node B. And in LTE, since it is somehow an evolved or uh, yeah, involved system, it's called involved node B. Yeah. Uh, we've got some, some controlling station uh, on the 2G side, we've got some controlling station on the 3G side, and that's um, hopefully an advantage. We haven't got that for the LTE side. Yeah? So the controlling station has somehow uh, moved to the E node B or let's say uh, even to the serving gateway. And uh, yeah, some, some, this gives us some uh, yeah, advantages since uh, yeah, this RNC and the BSC, they uh, need to do some, something that costs time. Yeah? And uh, we need to spare some time since we want to, to get more throughput, we want to be more reactive and we need to save some time. And uh, for the 2G and 3G, we've got the serving GPRS node, it's called uh, SGSN and after that we've got or maybe several of them here yeah, to, to carry all the traffic in the network and we got the gateway GPRS support node or let's say the GGSN here yeah, which is then the gateway to the World Wide Web and we've got something similar in uh, LTE so nothing new let's say but uh, well definitely they um, yeah, compared uh, to 3G it's really uh, somehow different that we call that the, the core network or um, uh, to distinguish the LTE is in is in reality the the RF let's say yeah so it's the RF and it's not the core network yeah? so the long-term evolution is in fact only this uh, the radio part yeah and uh, this involved packet core yeah uh, is is this core element? Are these core elements? Yeah, and the core elements they consist of um, yeah what we already know. Yeah, so some mobility management entity yeah to get uh, the handover up and running, or to to see where's the mobile yeah, in idle mode. Yeah, uh, we get uh, some yeah. So this uh, the connection to this E node B is uh, through uh, through some S1 interface, and the S1 interface can be distinguish between two, yeah, it's on the one hand the mobility management and on the one hand it's the user traffic, yeah, and the user traffic goes through this serving gateway, yeah, so this is the serving gateway, uh, there's a um, connection between those two, the mobility management entity and the serving gateway, and it's called the S11 interface. There's some sort like um, the uh, uh, VLR and the HLR, yeah, uh, in the GSM and 3G world, yeah, and here it's called the home subscriber server, yeah, where all uh, yeah, the quality of service uh, and the keys maybe are stored in. And from this uh, serving gateway with the S5 interface, we go to this uh, uh, public uh, data network gateway, yeah, and then through that to the internet. Very interesting is that uh, we've got the direct connection from one E node B to the other E node B. Yeah? That could be really direct, yeah? but in most cases it's going to be a, a virtual interface. Yeah? So it's not uh, maybe a direct line or a, 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 a real connection. It's a virtual interface. So uh, the E node B in practical manner is going to be connected to the mobility management entity or the serving gateway yeah, through the S1, but uh, over the S, uh, which, uh, which the serving gateway is more or less a router, yeah, and through this router function of the serving gateway, yeah, there's going to be some uh, interchange, yeah, let's say the X2 interface is going to be uh, through this serving gateway. Yeah. But in general, we speak, of, uh, we speak uh, of this X2 interface. The requirements from, um, yeah, from the next generation is, look like that. Uh, so it's going to be internet. Yeah, the service is going to be internet. There should be some sort of telephony available. Yeah. But it's basically then, um, let, we will see what's going to happen, but it could be voice over IP. Yeah. 
be some some old fashioned uh, circuit switched as well. Uh, yeah, there's some mobility, yeah, and maybe that's um, that's a big difference uh, between all other systems, since uh, all other systems, um, yeah, haven't got the, the in the specs the mobility. Yeah, so this. Uh, uh, this Wi-Fi or what else, yeah. So there's some sort of mobility inside, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> the LTE requires uh, up to 250 kilometers or even more, yeah. Uh, there's some broadcast defined, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you could run some television or what else, yeah. Some, or radio broadcast could be available as well. Uh, but. I have uh, strong doubts that this will ever happen since uh, the hardware is too expensive to, prov to provide these uh, broadcast services. Uh, the data rates, current status is we call that high data rates. Yeah? What's going to be happening in the future? I don't know, yeah? but high data rates means currently now over the air interface up to 100 megabits in downlink. Uh, maybe up to 300 megabits in, in the future. It depends on the uh, structure of the antennas, yeah? And uh, in uplink, up to 50 megabit per second, yeah? I mean, this, uh, when I've seen that first in my life, yeah, that I was in a driving car, I've got the laptop beside me, yeah? And I've got uh, 50 megabytes uh, with a normal modem, like a USB stick, yeah? And I've got 50 megabytes in the driving car, yeah? And I thought, oh, Herbert, that's going to be a new air, uh, area. Yeah? That's going to be, I, I'm part of the future. Yeah? That's, uh, it was incredible. Yeah? Me as a radio engineer, I could see 50 megabytes per second, uh, sorry, megabit per second. And that, uh, that, um, that I thought, uh, hey, you are in the future. Yeah? And uh, what we are talking now is not the future, it's reality. Yeah? So, that happens right now, yeah, and uh, I mean, it's just a matter to, to deploy that out there. Yeah? So in some areas in Austria, let's say in Vienna, it's already working. I mean, we haven't got the SIM cards, we haven't got the modems, but uh, uh, it's already state of the art right now. Yeah? And it could be that maybe in two years, in four years, yeah, uh, no one cares about this uh, 2G or even 3G because uh, uh, we are used to 100 of megabits in downlink. Yeah? I don't know what happens, but uh, it's very interesting subject. And uh, yeah, what these uh, radio engineers did, they tried to increase this uh, spect spectral efficiency. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, what leads them is, uh, yeah, that they, they said, oh, yes, this 3G with, with this wideband CDMA structure is not that efficient enough. Yeah. So we could go somehow one step further and use a different modulation scheme, and that's going to be I talk uh, I talk about that later. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and they th the engineers thought, uh, okay, this circuit switch data that's or circuit switch connections that's uh, that's old fashioned. Let's use the packet service only. And for this, they need some maybe user plane latency less than 10 milliseconds. That what they defined, and uh, the control plane. Uh, latency less than 100 milliseconds, and that's uh, that's now reality. Yeah, it's uh, really incredible. Yeah, we, we do reach that right now. Yeah, and it's comparable to the fixed network in some some stages. Yeah, so uh, internally in our company there were some some thoughts that uh, maybe if if uh, hundreds of users use one cell, yeah, and they are doing download even with a half with 50 megabit per second, so. Uh, what's going to happen with the fixed lines, yeah? Because the traffic on the air interface has to be somehow covered by the fixed lines, yeah? From the E node B down to the, some switching elements. And uh, well, um, what, what I've seen so far is that even the, the hard disks, yeah? Uh, they are somehow on the limit to provide uh, these data rates, yeah? So very interesting. Even you, you need to get the, the data on the laptop, yeah? So the laptop, some interfaces, some USB interfaces are even not able to, to carry that traffic, yeah? So, and we had really, to be honest, uh, we had to select the USB port, yeah? Because not all USB ports are, are working for that speed, yeah? So some shared USB ports, maybe shared with some uh, storages or like that, they are not capable of uh, of uh, providing that speed. So, um, 
it was a very interesting thing that the, the radio, yeah, the radio is that strong right now uh, that uh, yeah, on the fixed lines they, they haven't got, or even on the hardware, they, they need to think somehow different. Yeah? Some yeah, very interesting uh, thoughts I got then. Um, yeah, on the physical layer, uh, I mentioned already, they need to have some different uh, sort of modulation. And uh, in general, it's a single frequency network. So all happens on one uh, frequency. Yeah? It's somehow comparable with this uh, 3G story. So 3G uses only one uh, frequency, or let's say one frequency band. Yeah? And uh, here we've got some uh, single frequency network. So uh, in downlink, we use this orthogonal frequency division multiple access. Yeah? Uh, maybe I will provide some example to that. In uplink, something similar. Yeah? So the processor is, done, is doing something similar. Uh, it's single carrier frequency div uh, division multiple access. Uh, you can look in the in uh, Google uh, to find these things. They're very interesting modulation. And we use already this uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexes. Yeah? So this, uh, uh, the digital TV these days uh, and uh, the, the Wi-Fi is, is using that already. Yeah? So it's nothing new. And even the chipsets are already prepared. Maybe not for the frequency. We use that for, for this uh, LTE, but uh, for some different frequencies. Yeah? The first uh, handsets I've seen uh, they were very big, yeah. So the mobile stations were very big. They, they contained of that already existing, uh, uh, yeah, Wi-Fi or what else, yeah. So the chips are already there. They need just to be brought uh, to a smaller size. Uh, maybe the energy consumption, uh, maybe the frequency is different. Very interesting thing is that although all uh, mobiles are on the same frequency, yeah, or the, the network is on, on one frequency. The, the bandwidth is scalable, yeah? so uh, that's going to be very interesting for the operators. So they could start with maybe with on GSM 900 with maybe 1.4 megahertz, yeah, and provide still the old service for GSM if they if they have got enough uh, uh, bandwidth there. Yeah? They could extend to three, to five, to ten, to twenty megahertz. Yeah. So what uh, currently status is uh, right now all um, speed which are provided in the, in the web yeah, regarding LTE, they are measured usually with 20 megahertz. You cannot uh, say uh, less than the maximum. Yeah, um, yeah. new antenna technolo technology. So MIMO, yeah, multiple in, multiple output. Yeah, and this uh, adaptive antenna systems, they are, yeah. So AAS, maybe not, but MIMO is, uh, yeah, is common. Yeah? So all these uh, new fashion LTE modems, they use MIMO. Yeah? So they've got two receiving and uh, yeah, two re uh, transmitting antenna inside. Yeah? And uh, that's a state of the art. And uh, in fact, in theory, you could double the throughput then. Yeah? In, but that's theory. Yeah? Uh, but anyway, it helps. Yeah? It's, uh, it's a good approach for the technical to improve the throughput. Um, what, the uh, what the technicians thought is uh, they've got um, GSM, they've got the 3G, yeah? and, uh, and 3G is quite complex. Yeah? To be honest, it's too complex. Yeah? From the operator side, I mean, uh, from the operator techni technician side, it's too complex. Yeah? The, so uh, this um, power regulation all the time, yeah? and it's really a very complex thing. And, uh, the, at the end, LTE is not that complex. Complex. Yeah? So they really try to reduce the complexity of uh, the system. Yeah. So there's no BSC or even RNC. Yeah. Their uh, radio network controller, and this helps. Yeah. But anyway, there needs to be some controlling. Yeah. Uh, but this controlling has moved into these more intelligent E node Bs or uh, the MME. There's no soft or softer handover. Yeah? So this was uh, really uh, some invention during 3G time, but it doesn't help. Yeah? It doesn't. There's uh, less protocol overhead. And uh, it's somehow a self-organizing network. Yeah? So my colleagues are somehow feared about that, because uh, what, what we are doing is optimizing the network, yeah? finding out the best handover relations, finding out the, the best thresholds for certain situations. And if the network is self-organizing, yeah, it's doing it uh, itself. Yeah. So 
uh, could be that uh, maybe in five years I'm, I have to do something different. Yeah. So we will see what happens. Yeah. Uh, one important thing is uh, the management, the mobility management entity. It's uh, connected to the E not B, and doing this uh, non excess stratum signaling. What does that mean? Uh, this is the bureau management. Yeah. So from the very first beginning, every customer gets a default bureau. Yeah. There's some quality of service control inside. Yeah. There's the, the paging procedure inside. Yeah. The idle state and the mobility management. Yeah. And the user tracking is inside there. Yeah? So you, the user tracking somehow just got a different name. Yeah? It's uh, uh, in, in 2G and 3G we got this location area. And now in LTE it's a different name. It's a tracking area, but could be roughly the same. Yeah? There's some uh, signaling. Yeah, and uh, this signaling, yeah maybe connected uh, to other mobility management entity, signaling to the home subscriber server, signaling to the uh, serving gateway and the serving GPRS node, let's say to the old uh, old system in case of uh, doing a handover to 2G or 3G. The security management as well, and uh, that's the reason uh, I thought MME would be a good starting point for that uh, to mention. It's authentication and deciphering and integrity protection inside here. Yeah. That's going to be done by the MME. Um, yeah, let's go back to this uh, spectrum. Uh, it's called orthogonal frequency division multiple access. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Um, yeah, maybe you see that. Yeah. So this is going to be a different color than this. Yeah, these arrows. Yeah. Every arrow arrow should be one carrier frequency. Yeah? So we are using ortho, orthogonal frequencies in a spacing maybe of 15 kilohertz. Yeah? And uh, every user gets a minimum of them. Yeah? So that, that can be dynamically changed. Uh, it can, can change every five, uh, yeah, 500 milliseconds. The bandwidth is, um, yeah, could be modified by the operator. Yeah? So it's uh, from 1.4 to 20 megahertz. Yeah? So we've got some lower guard band and some upper guard band uh, because the next operator is going to be starting here uh, with the lower guard band. Yeah? So there needs to be some guard band to distinguish uh, uh, the interference from each other. And uh, there are pilots here. Yeah? Inside the whole bandwidth there are some pilots. The pilot is uh, to get the, um, or to figure out the, um, the propagation. Yeah? So if someone knows the propagation, yeah, it's, um, you, can, you can easily uh, calculate the, disturb the disturbance. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be done right now with these uh, pilots. Even in uh, GSM, we've got the, the BCCH who is transmitting, yeah, the, the time slot zero, who is transmitting always with, with full power. So you have some sort of reverence, and that's going to be important for the mobile to have some sort of re reference. There's going to be some DC subcarrier in the middle here. Yeah? Uh, where nothing is transmitted here. Yeah? So this is going to be yeah, some strange thing. thing yeah. um, if we see that on the frequency axis and, and on the time axis, yeah, we see that uh, uh, the users get definitely resource blocks. Yeah? Resource blocks, yeah? which uh, I, I draw, I've drawn some resource block here, which consists of 12 subcarriers, yeah, uh, having at least 180 kilohertz, yeah, and one of one of these resource blocks uh, has got seven symbols inside, yeah, and the duration is uh, half, uh, sorry, yeah, half a millisecond, yeah, and uh, yeah, we've got this upper guard band and the lower guard band here, and. As we see here, yeah, uh, the the user, this yellow user, is now having uh, for one millisecond uh, these two blocks, yeah, and another half a millisecond these two blocks, and then for some reason uh, it gets more resource blocks, yeah. So every half a millisecond, or at least every milliseconds, uh, the user can get more resource blocks, and. Uh, even um, 
if, if the user is doing a handover, yeah, because it's a single frequency network, if the user is doing a handover to another cell, yeah, it for sure will get another uh, resource block, which means, which means uh, it, it gets somehow another frequency. Yeah? Uh, compared to GSM, it's somehow similar. Yeah? So we've got uh, some, some frequency. Let's say this is one GSM channel, this is another GSM channel. Yeah? Uh, the mobile is using two GSM channels. Yeah? And, uh, uh, but could be could use more, yeah. Even if the quality of service allows him, he could use all uh, resource blocks, all of the 20 megahertz. So it's uh, uh, it's just a matter of the quality of service the user gets. Yeah? And if he's in idle mode, yeah, he could use nothing. Yeah, and this is very dy dynamically. Even in ha in uh, one milliseconds, that could change. Uh, so. Uh, Compared to the 3G world, yeah, 3G uses the whole bandwidth all the time. Yeah? And every user is on top of that bandwidth, uses the same bandwidth all the time. Yeah? We've got here uh, the users disting distinguished uh, by the frequencies. Yeah? And uh, uh, so it's um, somehow a good mixture between the 3G and the 2G. Yeah? Very interesting system. And uh, yes, yeah, seems to work somehow. Uh, regarding the user plane latency, um, yeah, these are just some some figures. Yeah, they are not uh, for sure exactly. Yeah, if the data arrives at the serving gateway, the, it needs somehow some processing. Yeah, it needs somehow, uh, yeah, traveling on the S1 interface to the E node B. In the E node B, some processing. Yeah, at least we have got some. Uh, uh, some latency from above uh, or around uh, 5 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. Yeah. That's going to be happened right now. Uh, there's some, yeah, uh, yeah in the, inside the application, yeah, if, if we consider upper layers then, yeah, uh, there could be some application to, um, um, yeah, s some process to figure out some disturbed uh, packets, some disturbed messages, yeah. Um, yeah, the control plane latency compared to 3G, yeah. On 3G we have got several states here and that's not that complicated now in the LTE. In LTE we've got just two states, yeah, even idle. Yeah, there's, to be honest, there's a, a third state, yeah, disconnected or switch off, yeah. But, um, yeah, we've got idle and uh, we've got um, that it's doing something, yeah. And uh, yeah, this transition is very fast, yeah. No, sorry, there's something wrong, yeah. So I just copied that, yeah. So it's uh, definitely wrong, yeah. Uh, it's RRC connected, yeah. And it's not registered, it's connected and doing something, it's, it's uh, transferring data. And uh, yeah, uh, this is much more faster than we've got right now. Yeah, for three G, uh, you need to wait at least half a second. Yeah, so roughly. Yeah, the data are coming uh, through through the pipe uh, to your mobile. Yeah, that's a quite long story. Yeah, at least at the very first beginning. Yeah, I always complain about that, but my colleagues do not believe that it's uh, it's too late for me. Um, there are some IDs inside the, the LTE, yeah. Um, yeah. In the network, you've got this uh, PLMN ID, so nothing will change, yeah, so that already exists, yeah. So what's going to be new is this involved packet service bureau ID. So there are some bureau, yeah. We know already some interactive bureau, some uh, uh, background bureau or what else, yeah. So and they all get some ID. We've got the network ident uh, entities. I mean, that's nothing new. Uh, we know already the physical cell ID. Uh, we can trace that more or less. Yeah. Uh, there's some tracking ID, which consists or in former times was this uh, uh, location area. And uh, the EMI, yeah, the EMI is well known. Uh, this GUMI is um, yeah, some sort of uh, MNC, M MCC and MME, MMEI. 
uh, nothing really new. Yeah, in the uh, involved Utran, what is new here? Yeah, uh, there's some sort of random value having four bits. Yeah, and all other things maybe are not that new. Yeah. In the user equipment, uh, the MC well known. Yeah, uh, this. Um, TMC, uh, TMSI, yeah, uh, the EMI, yeah, and this GUTI. Yeah. This keys in, in this LTE, um, well, it's um, somehow similar to the 3G story. Yeah. Uh, they, maybe, the, these uh, engineers thought, uh, how could they improve? The, this this key story or the ciphering or what else yeah and uh, they made um, yeah the same approach for 3G I would say this inside the USIM for authentication there are some uh, some bits somehow uh, uh, or keys inside yeah from that uh, th they are derived this uh, CK and the IK yeah. And um, yeah, it seems yeah, that it's somehow hierarchical, uh, hierarchical yeah? and uh, even uh, for this um, NAS, the non access stratum, yeah, there are some, some keys yeah, which can be generated. There are some keys for the E node B, yeah, for the communication, uh, the radio resource control, yeah, there are some um, in, encoded. Yeah, and, uh, Encoded. I don't know what's the INT right now, yeah, but it's in the spec anyway. Yeah, so it's somehow hierarchical. Yeah, so they think uh, to to implement more keys, yeah, it's going to be more safe. Yeah, I have uh, some doubts about that. Yeah, it could be that uh, just more processing power you need. Yeah, but maybe it's not safe enough. Yeah, since this morning I know it. Um, nothing is safe. Yeah, the purpose of this um, key separation. Yeah is um, distinguish the user traffic from signaling. Yeah? So uh, the keys uh, are stored in different locations maybe. Not only in one location, they are stored in different locations. That could help anyway. Yeah? Uh, there's a renewal. Yeah? Uh, the key could change on the fly. Yeah? That's going to be implemented right now in the specs. Uh, you've got somehow some security which can vary yeah? so the operator can decide uh, the, the, the higher the level of the security yeah? even to use uh, the, the key generation or even not use that yeah? and uh, they want to have that more independence of uh, the radio interface yeah? um, currently there's two mandatory sets of security uh, this uh, Snow 3G and the FIPS 197, and they and the mobiles they all uh, should support that. Yeah, even the E Note B and the MME, they should support these both uh, sets of security. Um, yeah, the algorithm is neg negotiated separately between the UE and the E Note B, and even on the NAS level. Yeah. And uh, the UE security capabilities sent in setup procedure algorithm uh, yeah, and can only change during the handover. So the handover, um, yeah, during handover, there could be some, um, yeah, some change in the security algorithm. Yeah. It's already defined in the specs. If it is going to be happen in reality that the operator will decide to go for that, that's going to be a question. Yeah. For voice over LTE, so I've just covered this um, packet story right now. Yeah, for voice over LTE, um, there's gonna be some discussions if um, if they want to have some circuit switched fallback. Yeah, so some circuit switched pipe, which um, yeah is gonna be introduced. At least they think about that. Yeah, uh, personally, I think this IMS will be the story for the future so every traffic will go through this IMS yeah? so it's already deployed out there uh, in some companies and uh, yeah 
this IMS is um, some strange thing for me as radio engineer and it has for sure some lacks of security and um, it's yeah it's not the it's not the best one I would say yeah. even um, some some old-fashioned relay just would provide less uh, latency than this IMS so uh, yeah it's gonna be some somehow have to be improved in the future this IMS story um, this circuit switch fallback what does that mean it could mean that within the LTE there's some sort of circuit switched inside it could well mean that uh, if if the LTE uh, discovers that the, op uh, that the user just wants to have circuit switch data providing telephony yeah, uh, the, the call is handed over to 3G or the call is handed over to 2G yeah, because of that yeah, because maybe 2G uh, needs some traffic and the 2G is perfect for voice yeah, and this LTE is perfect for data maybe uh, inside this uh, subscriber authentication in the IMS, yeah. So there's a SIP layer authentication that's well known already, yeah. And
have a question regarding the diagram you show us. Um, I've seen that the IPsec tunnel was terminating on the mobile device. I had the impression that they were terminated on the E node B, that they were going from the E node B to the gateway, but could, I mean. <laughs> uh, you mean um, from the IPsec, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Um, for example, this one here. Yeah. Uh, from yeah. the E node B to the serving gateway. Yeah, but I mean, the other, I mean, the question is, is the IPsec tunnel terminated on the user device or in the E node B, I mean, coming from the network? Yeah, there exists different approaches, yeah. Okay. So it could be in the E node B. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be implemented right now. It could be well in the, uh, so maybe on higher layers then, yeah, so the application requires some uh, IPsec then on the user equipment. But it's definitely not easy because uh, you're running this uh, X2 interface and with this X2 interface, this IPsec, so at the very first beginning there are some sort of troubles, yeah. Very interesting story. Uh, question regarding the uh, voice part. Uh, if you're doing the full IMS treatment, uh, this is going to be normal SIP. Uh, is this the same layer three plane as normal internet connectivity going to be, or is this a separate uh, subnet, VLAN, whatever kind of uh, channel separation than the normal internet access? So, can a normal smartphone, whatever, send from the, from the application side, from the user configurable side, send zip, send zip packets to the IMS servers or not? Yeah, a good question, yeah. But I believe it will happen like that, yeah. You will yeah. have a lot of fun there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this, uh, uh, the radio part is, uh, is just one, one tunnel and all data are going through that, yeah. So there, there are no, no separate channels for different applications on, on, on the lower level. Well, we have a separate PDB context for the voice transmitted data. Uh, we do not call that PDB context. It's, a, it's a, another bureau, yeah. So you could have different bureau, yeah. Maybe, a, yeah, and all that uh, in parallel, yeah. So there could be a voice bureau, there could be some uh, packet bureau, yeah. Uh, and on the, on, the, on the handset side, uh, if, if, the, if the phone calling features, the, the SIP features, are they going to be implemented on the baseband side of the phone or on the normal processor side of the phone? Do you have any ideas? Uh, sorry, no idea. Uh, sorry. I mean, since uh, it's not currently available right now, uh, I, I have no idea about that. Sorry. Just a, a remark about uh, your questions. Um, I think there are uh, plans to have uh, beer for signaling and for voice. So you have really for SIP a different one, uh, different PDP context for signaling and for voice. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's for sure some signaling beer. Yeah, there's for sure some. Yeah. So there are several beers defined already. Yeah. yeah. And just a, a quick remark as well for the um, why there are two keys for RRC. There is one oh, for yeah, encryption yeah. and one for integrity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This, uh, right, yeah, it is, yeah. So it, um, it's encryption, yeah. ENC means encryption, and the other one is uh, integrity protection, yeah. All these things that, I, that were new for me, I've written down that here, yeah. So some questions. So, I think that was the last one. Um, then thank you again. Yep. Thank you.